building your muscles, you have to stress them. But you have to stress them successfully so that you don't create any injuries and hold back your training. That's why it's important for you to pay careful attention to what my champions tell you. In reference to training aids, it's very important what type of clothing you're wearing, and that depends on the type of training you're doing and also the temperature of the room. If it's very hot, you may want to wear looser fitting clothing. You don't want to sweat too much if you don't want to lose too much body weight. Another problem is if the room is very, very cold and you want to keep your body warm, you may want to layer clothing, one layer on top of the other. The inner layer would be used to sort of wick the sweat away. You see, you get cold and chilled when you get fluid on top of the skin and cold air comes and rushes underneath. So by layering clothing, you whip the cold water away from the body and it's absorbed into the various layers of clothing. The inside you may want to be a cotton to help wick away the cold water. The type of clothing that someone would wear when they're training, it also depends on the type of exercises or the body parts that they happen to be training. If you're training your upper body, it's important that you have the clothing loose enough so that you're getting the appropriate and full range of motion. You don't want your clothing to restrict the range of motion. This could contribute towards a potential injury or a muscle tear. You want to have control over your body and not endure any restrictions. If you're going to be training your lower body, the type of clothing you're wearing is also very important. Some athletes tend to wear very, very tight lower garments when they're training, for instance, doing squats or leg extensions and so on. This may restrict the proper biomechanics of your training techniques. You want to be in control of the biomechanics of your movements and not have your clothing or outer garments restrict the particular biomechanics of the motion that you're going through. In terms of the type of shoes someone should wear for the proper stability and balance in training, if they're going to do weight training, they want to have a pretty solid, strong sole. If they're going to be doing endurance training where they're going to be running and there will be an, a large amount of ballistic forces, force vectors as their foot plants on the ground, it's very important that they have a shoe that will absorb a lot of those shock vectors. If you're going to be doing long distance endurance training where you're having these ballistic force vectors, you maybe want to have a little more width on the shoe as well as thickness in the sole to absorb the shock vectors. If you're going to be doing straight lifting, you want the base of the shoe to be a little bit more stable and harder. You don't want it to be loose to where it can sort of swivel side to side. This can contribute to an inversion or eversion injury of the ankle. Now realize when your ankle bends over, so will your knee. And that's how these knee injuries occur. You keep an unstable base in the lower foot and that will translate right up to the kneecap and right up to the pelvis and then to the low back. And this is how injuries come about. A weight belt basically supports your low back. And the reason people use it is low back pain and low back injury and low back weakness is probably one of the most common injuries we see in weight training athletes as well as the general population. I use the belt when I train, especially doing heavy squats or bent over rows for the back. I think that's very important to give you that support. And then in some exercises, it may be a little bit restricting, like doing cable rows. Um, so I don't use it until I know that it's not something I can control and I'm worried about it. Now the reason for the weight belt is what you're doing is you're adding additional stability to what we call the core of the body. The core is your torso. One of the things athletes have to remember is the core, your abdominus rectus, your erector spinae, all the muscles that surround your body are called your core. That is where the stable power in your body lies. So what you do with the weight belt is that you're actually adding an additional layer of power and strength to that core. I wear a weight belt while training just about at every exercise. I do it because it gives me more of a feeling of stability because I'm not allowing all the pressure on my lower back. Using a weight belt, it kind of restricts all that pressure from just bursting onto that one area because you're using your abdominal muscles to push against the weight belt and you're keeping your spine in line. However, it is better to train without a weight belt if, unless you actually need it. 
because when you use a weight belt, you're supporting the muscles and they are not being trained during that exercise. What also occurs is you're now changing the biomechanics of your body slightly. And now when you train without a weight belt, you're not accessing that additional stability and the curvature in your spine and stability in the pelvis is slightly different. You may not be ready for this. And then injury can occur due to that lack of stability you're used to having when you have the weight belt. You should consider wearing a weight belt when you're doing stiff leg deadlifts to take some of the pressure off the low back and stabilize it. You may consider using a weight belt when you're doing squats in order to stabilize a low back, especially if you have a weak low back area. Well, of course, in heavy squats, deadlifts, or even in heavy curls and presses, I use a training belt. And I like the training belt that goes around that is soft on the side, and you make it tight when you're doing the set, then when you're done, you loosen it, you breathe deep, tighten it to the next set. So that's a very important part. You may want to consider using wrist straps if you do have a weakness in the wrist, but it is important to still train your wrist. But with certain motions, you may begin to experience pain in the wrist. And sometimes wrist straps can help to stabilize the wrist joint and prevent further injury. Anytime you have an instability in the joint or you have a previous injury and you want to prevent an acute or minor injury from turning into a chronic one, you may want to support it with some type of strap. For instance, wrist straps are used to help stabilize the wrist, especially in motions when you're going into what we call hyperextension where the wrist bends backward. This can occur in a bench press, in an overhead press, whether you're using a straight bar or dumbbells. Only basic training aid that I use is uh, usually straps. On occasion, I'll, I'll wear a weightlifting belt, but straps primarily because I have a very weak grip. And on pulling exercises and uh, curling exercises, uh, that has a tendency to take the emphasis off my wrists and off my hands. Um, I use wraps because my, my grip isn't as strong sometimes. When you get to that last, those last couple of repetitions in a set, and it really does assist you in, you know, it's like an extra, it's like a cheat. So it helps. You need that sometimes. The knee is one of the most commonly injured joints in the body. And with knee wraps, you tend to give some additional stability. You have cartilage and ligaments within the knee joint, and it's very important to protect them and prevent injury. Once you get even a slight injury in the knee, you are more set up for more advanced injury in the knee. One of the most common exercises knee wraps are employed in is in the squat. Next to the knee, the elbow is probably one of the most commonly injured joints in the body. And the reason being is people may tend to extend too quickly or too hard or use too much weight in a fast jerky type of motion. This causes the elbow joint to snap to its full open position and may cause some tendonitis in that joint as well as some calcium deposits or tendon injury. One of the most common exercises or series of exercises elbow wraps are used for is any type of motion where you're going through flexion and extension. This can be curls, bench press, overhead press. Any type of motion that will open and close this joint will tend to contribute to injury in that joint. And thereby, wraps are many times used to help stabilize this joint when it becomes weakened. Many bodybuilders like to train wearing workout gloves. There are two basic advantages to this. For one, gloves protect the hands. Working with heavy knurled bars day in and day out can really tear up the skin of the hands and fingers. If your hands get too sore, it's very difficult to concentrate on getting the most out of your workouts. But another and even more important reason is that gloves allow you to get a better grip. Pieces of iron like dumbbells, barbells, or chinning bars can be very slippery, especially when your hands are sweating. And the better your grip, the more intensely and safely you can train. One of the worst mistakes a bodybuilder can make is training too heavy. 
When you try to work with too much weight, it's impossible to do the exercises correctly or effectively. You may be training hard, but you won't get the kind of results you expect. Not only that, but subjecting your muscles to weights they aren't prepared to handle substantially increases your risk of training injury. I'm not interested in trying to impress other people in the gym by uh, training with very heavy weight or weight that I really cannot control. I don't go in the gym throwing heavy weights around. You see a lot of guys, they go in the gym, they just start piling weights on the bar, they grunt and they're groaning and they're banging out reps or whatever they're doing. I don't do that, weight doesn't impress me. I go in the gym to improve my physique. So I always use a weight that I can handle. If what's heavy for me is, is, is light for somebody else, so be it. But as long as I am getting the feeling out of it, I know I'm at my limit and I don't, I don't push it past that limit. I start with a lighter weight and do a few high rep sets and make sure the muscle is warmed up properly. And also seems to make me, getting that blood flow seems to make me stronger. So when I do go up in weight, it's a lot easier for me. When you go into a gymnasium, there will be a very great temptation to lift as much weight as the other fellow or the other lady with whom you're working out. Remember, it's extremely important to lift weights relative to your own strength levels, not to try to prove yourself in a gymnasium in the sense that you're stronger than the next fellow. The important part here is that you use proper form and work to get the burn that you can achieve given your own strength levels. If you do that, you'll have a much better chance of staying around the gymnasium for a lot longer as the years pass and building the sort of body you want to build. The person who's not familiar with body balance or coordination is often the person who first picks a, a weight up. I remember the very first time I lifted weights when I was about 10 or 11 years old. What do we all do? We overtrain. We injure the muscle, we create too much mass too quick, and the next day we can't even comb our hair, right? Some athletes say, well, I'm just not putting on the muscle size. How often are you training? Three hours a day. How many days a week? Seven days a week. They're not allowing their body the rest time it needs for that muscle tissue to grow back together stronger. They're in a constant state of breakdown, a constant state of catabolism. They're not allowing the body to rejuvenate itself. They need to ease back. If they're training very intensely with weights, they really can train more than an hour or so with the proper type of training techniques. The muscles will exhaust themselves. They just won't be able to keep going and they will end up in this constant breakdown phase, not allowing for proper growth. It's great to be enthusiastic, especially for the younger bodybuilders. It's great to get in the gym, be enthusiastic, and then only do what your mind and your body can handle. Don't do more. Beginners have um, one thing in common. They all are very enthusiastic and they go in like a ball of fire and they want to do everything all at once, uh, as much weight as they can. They see other people and they want to be right there, right then. It takes years to re uh, reshape your body and form it into a, you know, a, a good muscular body. In fact, you really don't reach maturity you're about 27, 28 years old. The muscle and joint systems may become weakened from this constant overtraining. Tendonitis, tears to the muscle and tissue can also occur from this constant bombardment of stimuli without allowing the downtime for the muscle tissue to rejuvenate and go through the proper growth phases. Warming up before you train is an important factor in getting the most out of your workouts. Light pre-workout exercise literally warms up the muscles involved, as well as the associated tendons, ligaments, and joints, raises their internal temperature so that they are much better prepared to deal with the stress of heavy training. And this kind of warm-up activity also brings additional blood supply to the areas involved, so that your muscles will have all the nutrients and oxygen they need to support the intense contractions of serious bodybuilding training. One particular warm-up is general warm-up. It means that you increase the overall level of body temperature. This can be done in a variety of ways. You can ride a stationary bike if you like. You might also choose to run, or indeed you might engage in vigorous aerobic activity before coming into the gymnasium. This is particularly important if you live in a cold climate and you're going to take a workout coming directly from the cold into the gymnasium. You see people come into the gym all the time and they'll immediately throw themselves into a weight workout with no warm-up whatsoever. So the logic is not there. 
So what we need to do is warm up the muscle and the tendons enough so that we can go into the workout and begin working in with lighter weights and progressively add resistance, progressive resistance, until that resistance grows greater and uh, the muscles are worked efficiently. Bodybuilders most often warm up simply by doing light repetitions of the exercises they plan to do in that day's workout. For example, a set or two of light benches, rows, or squats performed before loading up the bar for serious training. The advantage of this is that the warm-up becomes very specific. The specific muscles, tendons, joints, and ligaments involved in the exercises are prepared to perform very specific movements and deal with specific types and angles of stress. Therefore, when bodybuilders explain that they do, say, five sets of barbell shoulder presses as part of their delt workout, if this is one of the first exercises they're doing for that particular body part, they may actually do six, seven, or even eight sets total. Those first sets are done as warm-up sets with very little weight. The bodybuilders don't count these warm-up sets as part of their overall set total, but they are very important nonetheless. Warm-up sets allow you to work through a full range of motion, to stretch as well as warm up the muscles tendons, joints, and ligaments involved, and to concentrate on form, to find the groove of the exercise so that each movement is performed and executed as effectively as possible. If you go in the gym thinking that you can lift the world, that's one thing, but if you don't use a safe approach, warm up thoroughly, stretch properly, and progressively add weight to each set, uh, then you're inviting injury to, uh, to set in. So I, I train very cautiously because I know that uh, it could all end tomorrow with a torn bicep or a torn pec. Many bodybuilders go through a program of stretching as part of their pre-workout warm-up, especially before a lower body workout. Muscles like the quadriceps and the hamstrings are extremely powerful, and it's easy for them to become tight between workouts. Taking time to stretch these muscles before a workout not only increases the effectiveness of your training, but it also can substantially reduce your chances of incurring a training injury. They also frequently stretch the muscles involved in a workout between sets. For example, grasping the ankle and bending the leg back to stretch the quads, or pulling against something to stretch and extend the lat muscles of the back. Most bodybuilders increase upper body flexibility by doing light sets of an exercise and deliberately working through as long a range of motion as possible, holding momentarily at the position of full contraction and again at full extension. Stretching movement should be done smoothly and gently because any jerking motion sets off what is called the stretch reflex, a mechanism in the body that causes the muscles to contract against your attempts to stretch them as a way of protecting themselves from being overstretched. Avoid this by stretching slowly, smoothly, and giving the muscle time to relax and respond. I'm a big believer in stretching. I think that's very important. Beginning of my workout, I stretch. I don't stretch a lot to the extreme. I just, you know, stretch a little, warm up. I'll even warm up with a bar. Uh, what stretching also does for me is, it's, it's giving me more separation in the, in the muscle when I stretch, and, and no injuries. So I, I really believe in stretching. I think it's an important part of, of a weight training. There are a lot of approaches to stretching. Some people like to partner stretch where they have somebody pushing them forward. This can be quite dangerous because you may have a tendency to go beyond the joint ranges of motion and tear tissue, muscle, and even joint and ligament. Very, very dangerous to do this. Important with stretching to go through that range of motion slow and easy without that bouncing or leaning forward type of maneuver. In order to do your training in the most effective and intense manner possible, it's important to be sure you stay properly grounded, that is, balanced in a secure, stable position before doing the movement. To correctly perform any exercise, you should first assume the appropriate stance. You should be stabilized, positioned securely and on balance so that you can handle heavy weights in the groove and give full concentration to the execution of the movement. Look around next time you're in the gym. See how many individuals are off balance when they do their sets. 
heads, how awkward and unstable they look when performing certain exercises. This need for stability is why a lot of exercise machines use belts to hold you securely in place while doing a movement. This allows you to concentrate fully on the muscles being trained rather than on trying to maintain your balance. All weight training, however, boils down to one basic principle. If you don't have proper balance, you create injury. Therefore, when we're looking at the weight trainer, the bodybuilder, if you will, but the athlete, the person who's competing every day, the baseball player, the football player, soccer player, rugby player, you name it, you have to have proper posture. And posture, correct posture, starts with the feet. And if you don't stabilize your posture from below your knees, you're going to be compensating for foot instability. That foot instability creates further back problems and further neck problems. So again, proper weight training, specifically for the beginner, starts with proper organization of posture, proper movement. Take your shoes and socks up. Look at your feet. If your arches are flat, if your arches roll in, that's called pronation. If your feet roll out, that's called supination. If you flare one foot out, that's called external rotation. We want proper and efficient balance in everything. And if you start the beginner off properly, if he's even 15 years old, 18 years old, or 12 years old, the point is, is to start with balance. Weight training should start comfortably and efficiently. You should not have a lot of joint soreness. You should start it off repetitively enough, however, that you feel like you're working your body and you feel good about it. There are two aspects of body posture which are very important also to the notion of preventing body injury. The first of these has to do with the particular stance. When you plant your feet, plant them in a way that's solid from the ground all the way up. And in fact, concentrate intensing your body from the ground up as you pick up your weight. The second point is that when you're lifting your weight, there should be a basic balance between the way in which the body is moved from the front to the back. So if you're doing a cheek curl, for example, too much sway will shift the arc of balance in such a way that it makes you vulnerable to back injury. So balance in the sense of moderation in respect of any particular movement is a key factor in preventing injury. And it's important to bear that in mind whenever you exercise. Proper biomechanics of lifting and training are very important. We must pay attention to the biomechanics of the head positioning, first of all, because the head is a center of balance in the body. And as you move your head, it changes the biomechanics of the entire spine, pelvis, and so on. One of the other problems with training is that people must pay attention to their joint structure function. They have a tendency to go beyond what is normal joint range of motion. For instance, when they're doing cross lateral flies on a bench, they should not go beyond 180 degrees when their arms are directly outstretched. Sometimes athletes have a tendency to go even much further beyond that 180 degree line and they tear the tissue at the pec deck area. And you see a lot of athletes with stretch marks across this area from tearing the tissue. Not only because they may have grown too quickly, but because because they've gone through a phase of tearing tissue, going beyond the normal physiologic ranges of motion. It is really key when you're training to have a spotter because so many times somebody's on a bench and they have too much weight and they get stuck with the bar on their chest. The ideal bodybuilding physique is characterized by balance and proportion, and so is the ideal bodybuilding workout. Total training means you need to work your entire body, not just your favorite muscles. Unbalanced training, working certain muscles too much and neglecting others, not only leads to the development of a disproportionate physique, it causes some muscles to overpower others, increasing the risk of training injury. is that visualization techniques and full focus techniques are extremely important. A visualization technique means that when you come into a gym and you're doing a particular exercise, that you focus very intensely on the exercise you're doing. Perform it in a methodical and strict manner. Visualize the result you want to achieve, but keep your attention on the movement of the weight to be sure that in doing it, that you do not go beyond the points that are safe in the range of motion of the exercise. So if you're doing a curl, for example, that you don't sway your back too intensely. That if you're doing a triceps press, that you don't allow the bar to jam down on your elbows and thereby injure the elbow area. Similarly on a squat, when you squat down, you should come to the bottom very gently, not bounce from the bottom position. Remember, the idea is not simply to go up and down, 
but rather to feel the exercise all the way down and all the way up. When you do that, you've got two reps for every one. Many bodybuilders who are just beginning will tend to throw a weight up and then let it come down as fast as they can. The important part here is to visualize the motion and tense the arms as you're coming up as well as coming down. That way you always have two reps for one. 100% mental focus is essential to training safely. You know, of course, the Weider system emphasizes muscular development. That's what we want. We want to make as many gains as possible. We want to put on quality muscle. But within these, uh, within these parameters, okay, we're going to train safely. And that starts by focusing 100% on what you're doing, putting the mind into the muscle. If you don't feel good, if you can't concentrate on what you're doing, then there's more of a chance of injury. You know, you're not concentrating on the weight. You know, you may pull off a weight and there's another plate in front of it and you're not thinking and you pull that weight off onto your foot. So it is important to definitely be there mentally. That's when injuries usually occur. I have to concentrate. If there's any distraction in the background, you know, people coming up to me, I have to stop and say, you know, I'm training and, and uh, we'll talk later when I'm finished. Remember that an intensive workout is a very serious business and therefore you should treat it with the serious consideration it deserves. There are two kinds of trauma, micro trauma and macro trauma. Everybody knows macro trauma, that's like getting hit by a Mack truck, you know, once you get smacked you're down. However, microtrauma is really a cumulative mechanical stress. That's, that's, for instance, how do you lift weights, not just the load of weights. And often, if your posture is bad, we call it pathomechanic or stress-bearing posture. You can create injuries. For instance, if all I'm doing is working my biceps instead of my triceps and my chest flexors instead of my upper back extensors, I may develop my posture into a squatting posture. And no matter how much you build or how much, how much larger you want to get, you might actually be injuring yourself just because your posture is bad. So everything that we do in sports science is really built around one word, and that word is balance, good coordinated physics. We want distribution of weight in the front of your body, the back of your body, the sides of each part of your body. And not only that, but obviously we want you to work your lower body as much as you do your upper body. You know, the weekend warrior, the weekend athlete often screws their body up just because they go out and they work their upper body and forget about the lower body. I've never had injuries myself. I think the reason why is because my forearms are really, really strict. I started with the basics, real light, and I've improved, worked up over the years, and I'm confident now mentally. I know I can, you know, what kind of, of weight I can handle. Probably the most important thing you can do while training to help prevent injuries is just train smart. The person that goes the heaviest isn't always the best bodybuilder. Doing heavy weight is important, but if you can't do the, the heavy weight with proper form, you're wasting your time, and most likely you will end up with an injury. The majority of injuries take place because of sloppy exercise technique. So what we need to do is we need to look towards making the exercises as perfect as possible. Post-exercise muscle soreness is the result of microtrauma, that is, microscopic injuries to the tissues involved. Although soreness is the result of damage, it's not really classified as injury. In fact, it's one good way of being certain your workouts have been sufficiently intense. However, when soreness becomes so acute that you can't do your next workout, it's time to back off and reduce your training intensity until your body is more fully adapted to the stresses of your workouts. I know when to stop if I have a minor injury because if you're in contact with your physique and you know how you should feel when you're training, then you know that this is something that's not good. You know when, it's, when, when a pain is a good pain and when it's a bad pain. And, and that's why it's important to always listen to your body. There's a big difference between post-exercise soreness and the pain of injury. Pain is a warning sign that tells you an area has been injured, that you need to avoid that activity and allow the part of the body involved to recover. You can work through soreness, but trying to work through the pain of injury is a mistake. With an injury, if you feel any pain at all during the exercise, you've gone too far. When you ignore this warning sign, you risk re-injury, more severe injury, or chronic injury. 
minor injuries are going to happen, and I think that the only way that you can circumvent them or work your way around them is by backing off. Um, a minor injury can become a major injury so long as you continue to, to beat it to death. I take time off. Uh, massages are good. Uh, heating rubs are good. Uh, ice packs. Things like that will take away the immediate pain, but you've also got to back off a little bit. That's all. If you have soreness or inflammation, you should back off 10%. Now, that means if you hurt your Achilles tendon, if you hurt your tendon in your knee, your shoulder, your biceps, your neck, your back, any part of your body, if you have soreness or pain, you back off 10% but you still do the full motion of the activity. If you, and you do that for three days, by the way, for three day period. If anywhere along that three day period, you still can't do the activity without soreness or pain, you back off another 10%, but you still maintain full range of motion and activity. If it still hurts, you still have range of motion, then you back off another 10% or a total of 30%, you stop all activity. You stop the activity and go see a doctor. I've never been seriously injured but I think that that is uh, possibly due to the fact that I've always been conscious of that. And I have always taken time to warm up properly and uh, to ice down joints and such that were uh, swollen or painful. And also I've been very, very uh, careful to listen to my body using the instinctive principle and backing off if I feel that there is a potential injury in sight. Everything's internal about my feel, what's going on inside of my, my body. Um, if I'm pulling something a little too far, I know it. An acute injury can result from a trauma such as a blow or a cut from a sudden stretching or twisting force or from the cumulative effects of overwork. However, chronic injury is the result of long-term abuse of the body, injuries made worse over time rather than being treated and resolved, and these are not so easily dealt with. Chronic injuries are persistent, long-term problems that can sometimes prevent you from ever training at your full capacity, and they should be avoided by adequately treating acute injuries whenever they occur. Another important aspect of injury prevention is knowing when in fact you're injured. Many bodybuilders who are competitors need, unfortunately, to work past their injuries or around them. Some bodybuilders in doing this move from having simply a minor injury to a major one. If you're a beginning bodybuilder, it's particularly important that you pay attention to two aspects here. The first is that if when you're exercising, you hear a pop or in fact feel a tearing sensation, desist or cease doing the exercise immediately. Then pick up a, an empty bar, a bar without any weight at all, and move once again through the movement, making sure that there is no pain. If the pain persists, don't do any exercise for at least 48 hours. Come back in 48 hours and try again with simply an empty bar. If, when you're working with the empty bar, you do not feel pain, then you can gradually increase the weight on the bar. Go up by five pounds on each side. If, as you're working towards your normal limit, and you're feeling no pain whatsoever, then you're pretty safe. On the other hand, if you find that you're in a situation where you are having problems and pain does persist, you should cease exercise or exercise with a weight that is not giving you pain. If you follow those two simple rules, you'll be much better prepared to work out without injury. We have to be very careful not to get injuries because injuries become permanent if you keep injuring yourself. When you do get an injury, you should immediately stop and then have it analyzed what the injury is before you continue on. If you hear a crack or a snap or you hear something or feel something actually tear, immobilize that joint and get to the proper medical care immediately. Some injuries when you rip a ligament, for example, make some noise. That noise, you have to pay attention. If it moves a pop, then you know, you have to check by the top. Two, even if it's a muscle injury, if it swells, immediately you have to go to the doctor, because that could be something very serious. Three, if it's some kind of a jamming in the joints itself, then you have to really check it, and also check it with the doctor. And one of the problems I found in bodybuilding is the bodybuilders got so strong and so resistant to pain that accidentally I took x-rays on their lumbar, and I saw fractures. And I said, wait a minute, do you have a fracture in the lab? How did you get this? Oh, my back's been sore for months. I don't know.
one of the basic principles, if an injury happens to occur, is RICE, R-I-C-E. R stands for rest, immediately rest the injury. I stands for ice, and a good way of icing it down is to just take some water, put it in a styrofoam cup, and leave that in the freezer. Then if you get an injury, you just go into the freezer, pull out the styrofoam cup, pull off the top of it, and now you have a nice styrofoam holder to rub along that muscle belly. Now when you're icing that muscle group, you want to go along the muscle fibers. Icing will tend to decrease inflammation and decrease the swelling in the muscle. So we have rest, ice, compression. We compress down, push down on that body part that's been injured. And finally, elevation. We elevate or lift up that body part. Say, for instance, we damage our ankle. We keep our ankle higher than the rest of our body. It tends to decrease the swelling and decrease the amount of fluid accumulation that would deposit in that joint immediately following injury. When you get an injury of any kind, the first thing to do is put ice on it. No heat. It must be ice. This is a, a complete rule. And a lot of people put, uh, put the heat, then inflames it more. Immediately following an injury, I would recommend putting an ice pack on the injury to uh, reduce the swelling and the damage that it will do to the tissues. We want to compress to get the swelling out. We want to rest it, obviously, not to re-injure it. You want to ice it to cool it down and contract the tissue, and you want to elevate it to, again, get any swelling out of it. So compression is a support mechanism, whether it's a taping procedure or whether an elastic strap or just supporting it with a, a towel to keep it nice and tight. But remember, elevating it above the heart is probably one of the more important ideas. Whether you're on your back or you're, you're on your stomach, you want to try to raise the part up enough to get good circulation going. In reference to compression, you want to put mild pressure, but not so hard that you're restricting blood flow. Some people have a tendency with a bad injury to tie it so tightly that they end up with a lot of pain in that joint due to that heavy duty compression. Rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Now, if an injury over this first 72 hours is still sore, it's still swollen, it's time now to do what's called contrast therapy. And that means that you use ice on it first, maybe 15, 20 minutes, depending on degree of severity, and then you should use hot, moist heat. And that's whether it's a hot shower or a hot bath. We usually recommend, by the way, using a hot bath with Epsom salts. I like the magnesium sulfate, draws the soreness out of the tissue, but it's contrast therapy. Ice constricts, the heat dilates, draws fresh oxygenated blood in, and you can duplicate the process. You could do 10 minutes of ice, 10 minutes of the moist heat, and repeat it immediately, 10 and 10 again. But again, you want to comp compress and we want to elevate. Get the swelling out of the tissue as quickly as possible. If you do not have full range of motion, we do not recommend you in trying to stretch through full range of motion. We think that you should do contrast therapy, get the muscle tissue to relax, and then the progressive stages of rehabilitation, work the joint and muscle out comfortably, the tendon or ligament out comfortably to make sure that you're not overstretching or over-traumatizing it either. Now remember, in an acute injury that happens very quickly to you, you want to rest and you want to give yourself sufficient rest to where that injury or that weakness that you've experienced is not going to turn from an acute rapid injury to a long-term chronic one. So give yourself enough rest. With the ice, it's important to use a lot of ice, but don't leave it on the skin so long where it starts to sunburn the skin or cause frostbite on the skin. You may want to put a towel in between the ice cubes and your skin. You may want to put some type of covering on the skin before you place the ice on it. Or you can take ice, put it in a towel, wrap it up, and rest it on that body part. The purpose for taping or supporting a joint is for protection. Often if you have injury, if you have edema, fluid swelling, any of those reasons for quote pain syndromes, if you have pain in the joint, you want to protect the joint. And taping is really one of the safest ways to do that. So when you go ahead and stand up, you're going to find out that the tape works like a big spring to protect the knee. Go ahead and stand up right here. See how it bounces? Yeah, it does. It doesn't come loose either. Brand new ligaments and muscles. Forms. So it supports you, yeah, yet it gives you, and it actually gives you some elasticity to the movement. Massage therapy is actually physically, manually manipulating muscle, ligament, and tendons mechanically. In other words, the therapist is doing it themselves to the patient. One of the greatest benefits is real simple, just increased circulation. 
the manual person, the doctor, the therapist, whoever's doing the massage therapy themselves, can get into ligament, muscle, tendon, try to stretch out those tight spots, which no matter what kind of therapy you seem to do or what kind of stretching you seem to do, you never quite can get it. And this is where the subjectivity of the patient talking and explaining to the therapist where they feel it is the most important. But the greatest benefit for general massage overall is just, again, simple increased oxygenation and tissue. Home massage can be a wonderful thing if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you may be creating further and greater injury. For instance, if you have a contusion, hematoma, some swelling in the tissue, and you massage, try to massage it out, you might be goofing up and massaging it in and creating further micro tears of the muscle fiber. You should simply be careful, not overdo it. In fact, if you can't rest it, ice it, compress it, and elevate it, you really need to see a specialist. Go to your family doctor. The best thing I can say is to you know, slow down, and learn the techniques of how to live properly right from the beginning so that you don't develop bad habits. You know, right from the onset, you can develop really good training habits and uh, have a long, healthy, prosperous career in, in training and lifting weights and conditioning. So when you're young, you get these injuries and you work on, and you have them all the time. You've got to let them rest and heal. So hopefully what you can do at home is simply look at the literature, understand the proper movements, don't do too much. It's better in the beginning to do enough stretching, warming up, warming down before and after you lift weights, and making sure that the joints are warmed up efficiently before you train. This trophy represents a dream of every bodybuilder. And every bodybuilder who has won this trophy in a Joe Weider Miss Olympia event proves to the world that he is the best bodybuilder of the year. The exact identical techniques and principles that these champions use to develop their body to win this trophy is in your hands now. It is up to you to apply yourself, put these techniques into action, put guts behind them, work them hard, and you too will develop a body you can be proud of. The shape, the full deltoids, the pecs, the abs, I want it all. I want the thighs, I want the calves, I want the tight glutes. You give me a, a man who's tight and fit and firm and hard, uh, and you've got probably Adonis. But it's attainable, and I think every man would probably want that for himself. I know every woman would want it for herself. The future of bodybuilding is very exciting because now people of all ages are now involved in resistance and weight training. 60 years old is not old anymore. We have people in their 70s and 80 years old who look like they're 30. Physical fitness, I mean, it not only makes you strong physically, but it makes you strong mentally. Outside the gym, you take that same philosophy with you, and whether it's in schoolwork or it's in business or it's in relationships, you realize that there are no limits and you make, you get from it what you put into it. Get off your big butt, get into the gym.